Hi everyone, my name is Scott and thank you for tuning into my video today. This video that you're about to watch is unlike any other video on the internet related to chronic illness. This is because I don't have any type of protocol to cure you, I'm not trying to sell you any type of supplements, and I'm not even here to vent about my own personal story. What I'm here for is to share my own research findings as a scientist and also propose a novel mechanism for the induction of chronic disease. Now, I'm going to have a heavy focus on environmental science, which is an area that our researchers have totally ignored. Back in 1930, we had 6% of Americans self-reporting as having a chronic illness. More recently, that number is up to 6D%. percent. Now, it's true that modern science is able to keep a lot of people alive now, but um, genetics does not explain Viruses do not explain why this number has jumped up so high. And I believe it's factors in our environment that's causing that. And I'm going to go into detail about how and why that's happening. This video is for people who have gone from doctor to doctor to doctor, and they're not getting any solid answers from anyone. And at best, they might find somebody on YouTube that gives some vague explanation of your mitochondria are dysfunctional and that's more or less a, a bunch of BS and that's not getting at the root cause of things. I'm here to focus on causation. Why are you sick and what's driving it? Please, please watch as much of this video as you possibly can. I know that it's not short, but it's because I have so many findings that I want to share with you. If you deal with chronic fatigue and you just physically don't have energy to watch anymore, please go to the description, click the link. I've put all the figures in my video in that link that you can study those figures at your own pace. And please, if you can, if you like this video, please share this with as many others as you possibly can to help promote awareness of the subject especially towards researchers so that they can conduct proper clinical studies and trials. Also, I've labeled each section in the slider. So if you have a limited number of spoons and you only have the energy to watch um, a certain amount of time, feel free to use that to skip ahead to whatever parts might be most relevant to you. So next, I'm gonna take some time to explain my credentials and background and uh, a bit of my story if you'd like to listen. If you just want to jump straight into the science, feel free to skip ahead this section and, and go on to the next. Thank you. So as my story started out, I got sick back in 2017. I was working as a scientist in a lab where I was handling chemicals all the time. And I came into contact with a particularly hazardous chemical called hydrazine and um, after handling that I became very ill very suddenly uh, pale in the face pouring sweat uh, dizzy tired difficulty breathing feeling like I was gonna pass out and this just happened suddenly like I was just sitting at my desk having a cup of coffee and all these symptoms hit me and I had no idea what was going on and I walked across the street to the emergency room and uh, nearly passed out there and have been battling horrible health issues ever since. And I've come to learn that my situation isn't entirely unique. There's millions of people out there that deal with chronic illness like chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia and now this long COVID and so forth. And so, I, I, I couldn't understand how something so common and so severe um, that's affecting so many people, it just isn't well researched, isn't well understood. Um, I've seen a, at least a couple hundred doctors by this point. And um, the view that most of the doctors take is, oh, we, we don't see anything clear and definite in the test results so we're just going to label this as anxiety because we have other patients to deal with and we're going to push you out the door and 
that's just not satisfactory. So, um, you know, it was a gift and a curse having a background in science and biology because I had to be my own doctor. And so I was able to um, study up on the subject and all this research and testing and understand things for myself rather than just what my doctor was sharing with me and use my background in biology to make sense of it, to make sense of all these weird new symptoms that I was having every day, every week come up um, for years and years and years. How, how is that possible? Like, what does that mean? What's driving that? And, um, you know, so I would just dive into reading hundreds and thousands of publications over years. Um, when I got sick, I uh, was moving to a new state. I had just started a PhD program and I did about a year of that and then I had to drop out. Uh, and then for a couple of years, it, it was really rough, but um, I learned there wasn't any one particular thing that helped me, but I started making these, I call them functional improvements because I wasn't really feeling better, but I was able to like slowly do more and more. Um, and I was working part-time again, and uh, I was working at uh, a couple different biotech companies. One of them, I uh, was consulting for research when it comes to chronic fatigue syndrome and POTS. So for those who don't know what POTS is, it's postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Uh, it's part of the dysautonomia umbrella, and it's extremely common uh, for people with chronic fatigue syndrome as well. And um, so I just spent even more time learning about this subject and I, and I did more advanced testing. And, um, you know, I, I was starting to, to be on the up, but I had moved to a new apartment uh, in 2021. And when I moved, I just, I wasn't feeling well. I mean, I know the moving itself is a lot of exertion and tiring but I, I wasn't feeling right, um, something wasn't right. And I come to notice that whenever I was in my bedroom, I would feel this really stimulated feeling of like, like just not getting air and, you know, very weird. Um, and I realized that uh, it must've been the, the wood varnish in my bedroom that was affecting me. And even when I wasn't in my bedroom, I was feeling just like very sick, flu-like symptoms, inflamed. And I did some mold testing and there was massive amount of mold, actually not in the house, but outside. And so whenever the, the windows and such were left open, you're getting mold blown in from outside. Um, and so I had a mold problem with that place and, and I moved out and I moved to a new place um that was like all tiles so there wasn't dealing with wood varnish and i was still getting sicker and sicker but the symptoms were different and i i couldn't understand what was causing it uh but i wasn't able to tolerate that place either uh and you know up until this point i really didn't consider myself to have to have any environmental sensitivities at all i just had this quote unquote chronic fatigue syndrome so then I moved to another apartment and this apartment um, I was actually good with at first and then I had left the apartment to sign the lease and um, when I came back they had painted the whole place and I was getting I noticed immediately I didn't feel right in there um, and you know I knew I had problems with the varnish and the mold in the previous places but um, I didn't know I had any problem with paint and it became very obvious. And so after that exposure to paint, I've had just tremendously worse brain fog, um, a lot of muscle weakness, especially in my arms, some in my legs, uh, a lot of like fibromyalgia pain in my arms. Um, and it's been extremely rough, uh, but you know, for better or for worse, I have learned what was causing my symptoms. So each of the exposures that I had, I could tie back to something specific in each of these living environments. And it was only because I moved to so many different living environments 
that I was able to really identify what exposures would cause what symptoms. And so this video that I'm sharing now is something that uh, if even if you have a known uh, trigger that is not environmental, like say you had COVID or, or a virus that triggered your chronic illness, uh, that doesn't mean there isn't an environmental component to your illness. That doesn't mean that you don't have something environmental propagating your illness. So that's what I want to talk about today. Before I jump right in and start explaining the mechanism that I'm proposing here, I wanted to briefly just provide a background on what this means and what we can interpret and debate um, amongst everything that I'm presenting. So I think of all the evidence that I have, any one of them might just be suggestive by itself, but with an overwhelming amount of suggestive pieces of evidence, I think taken together, it becomes substantial enough to validate what I'm proposing to the point where other researchers can then take this theory and try to prove different aspects of it. So studies need to be done, studies need to be funded, we need to have you know, clinical trials and so forth. Um, but I'm hoping what I provide here today is enough to warrant that research to be done in the future because this is not the end. Um, I do, I have made this whole uh, mechanism and, and put this whole mechanism together, not just by any one means, but by taking my own personal experiences, uh, my own personal test results, um, research papers of which I've read hundreds or thousands of, and also just connecting these pieces together with scientific reasoning. I have tons of data that I'm going to be showing you guys throughout the rest of this video. So I wanted to take just a minute to talk about what we're able to interpret from all these test results and, and figures and images. And I think it's important to state this because even though some of the interpretations and conclusions from these test results are a bit open-ended or not totally solid, it's important to understand what we can and cannot interpret so that we're not dismissing things that are solid and concrete because everything that I have shown here today, it's the culmination of many years of work and I think it's very important and can go a long way in helping many millions of people's lives. And um, I want everything that I'm saying and showing here to be taken very seriously. So all the test results and, and images and figures shown, they, they can't be debated. They're not AI generated, they're all real things. Um, what can be interpreted or debated is what the mechanism of how that symptom is showing or or how it's affecting your body or you know everything around those images and um, I think the mechanism that I've outlined is pretty solid and I thoroughly entirely believe it to be true for myself I absolutely know this mechanism is true for me and I think this mechanism is probably true for many other thousands or millions of people out there based upon what I've heard from people and, and talking with them. So I think that a lot of the other people out there that are dealing with chronic illnesses, they might have a piece of it be true for them, or it, it might be the whole thing. Um, and you know, this is such, people with chronic illnesses, it's such a heterodiverse population that um, you know, we could have multiple totally different illnesses within this group. So um, I just want to propose a mechanism that I know is true for me and leave it to the viewer and other scientists to in interpret this and, and infer what is true for which patient groups and, and um, you know, are there exceptions or where are there differences, right? But the whole mechanism that I'm proposing is going against the idea that um, 
how doctors view their patients, right? So the way that doctors currently and researchers currently view patients is that they exist inside of a vacuum. So that's just simply not true, right? Everyone is constantly affected by their environment. We're always in our environment. Um, we're affected by, you know, radiation and, and sunlight and air quality and this and that and so forth. Um, and this discussion here is focusing on environmental drivers of those chronic illnesses. So things outside the patient that are affecting the patient chronically. Um, and I really want to hit home that this disease is not dysfunction, right? So dysfunction is a gaslighting terminology that doctors use to dismiss the valid concerns of their patient. That um, it's saying, okay, dysfunction means you are not working, right? So it's saying you exist by yourself in a vacuum and because of your genetics and who you are, you don't work properly, right? Um, that's just not true. This is a state of damage. This is a person who was totally healthy, totally normal, not dysfunctional whatsoever. And something happened to them that they became damaged. And we know this is not dysfunction because millions of people that have these diseases have tried so many different medications, so many different drugs. And what drugs are, are just toxins. Drugs are targeted toxins. They work on one or maybe a couple specific pathways in the body. And so the body is is like a teeter-totter, right? It's, it's in a state of flux. And, um, you know, if, if one biomarker increases, the body might increase or decrease an another biomarker um, to compensate for that or signal for that change and so forth. And drugs block that or they um, turn that on and they it's kept on. So it's, it's just forcing these biopathways. So millions of people have tried thousands upon thousands and thousands of these drugs that are affecting all these different pathways. And, you know, in a small subset of patients, a, you know, one or a couple of drugs might have some limited benefit, but there is no cure because there's no dysfunction. The, the patient is operating, uh, their body is operating, it's the best it can. There's so many different mechanisms that the body has to compensate for any damage that's done. So if you're chronically ill, your body has gone through multiple layers of defenses that are not working properly for it to become totally dis um, damaged. And so I, I really want us to stay away from this is not a dysfunctional problem, this is a damage problem. And why I think Considering the environment in your disease, even if you've had a known established viral trigger is important, um, I have an, al an analogy that I'd like to use about farming. So if you're a farmer and you're growing you know, some plants in a field and one day you see, okay, all these plants are sick and dying, they're not doing well. Do you say, okay, these plants have some genetic mitochondrial psychosomatic disorder or are you just a bad farmer like did you not give them enough food and water and sunlight and protect them from disease and pests and you know when when it comes to plants right we accept that everything is environmental but when it comes to people it's never environmental when i've seen hundreds of doctors and none of them suggest that, oh, something in your environment, like have you checked your house for mold or this or that, right? They never consider that in the state of disease. They always want to prescribe you a pill because they're gaslighting you into thinking the dysfunction is in within you. And instead of checking your home for potential 
toxins and hazards and things that are affecting you and making you sick and contributing to the disease they they don't even investigate that they don't they don't look into that there is no home testing or air quality testing or anything like that there's no knowledge or awareness of this whatsoever and all the blame is put on the patient that they're somehow magically dysfunctional and that's not true and even if you have mitochondrial dysfunction right so if your mitochondria isn't pumping out ATP enough first of all that's not even necessarily dysfunction the body may be doing that purposefully to compensate for another problem and number two even if it, it was a primary dysfunction it's almost never primary dysfunction right so what is upstream of that of that mitochondrial damage that caused that mitochondrial damage there's always a cause and effect and to date we've only focused on this effect part nobody's taken any consideration to what the cause could possibly be and that makes no sense and it's really dumbfounding to me that all our doctors and researchers just accept this and this is just a bad way to do science um and it's it's not leading to any quality of life benefit to our patients it's not getting people better um and so i want to propose an alternative pathway that we understand what is the cause right so we don't have to understand every single biopathway in the body to stop disease at its root to stop the cause of the problem so that the body can try to heal the best it can um and so i have been previously diagnosed with mcs which is multiple chemical sensitivity uh pots which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome chronic fatigue syndrome uh fibromyalgia and earl's donlow syndrome which is a connective tissue disorder so i've had all of these diagnoses and one way to think about it is okay does this person randomly get all of these different chronic illnesses that are totally separate all at the exact same time or is it really just one disease and it's manifesting in in these different ways and that's that's kind of a big problem because uh patients are self-identifying with particular diagnoses so there's different facebook groups and so forth for people with earl's donlow syndrome or long covid or this or that and the patient is really the one hanging on a particular diagnosis whether they give it themselves or they just happen to see a doctor that diagnosed that first or if they have multiple diagnoses but one particular problem sticks out in their mind more that they're really identifying with these diagnoses um and that's really a problem because there's there's no um you know like for for a lot of them there there really isn't a medical distinction for it right so for example uh in the chronic fatigue syndrome group uh 50 of patients have been diagnosed with earl's donlow syndrome so should they leave uh chronic fatigue syndrome group and go to an earl's donlow's group um and i i think that's making more problems and i think people need to look at the root cause of illness even if you have a connective tissue disorder that doesn't necessarily mean it was genetic or even if you have genetics that predispose you to a connective tissue disease that's not necessarily sufficient to have an illness so dr peter rowe has talked about um you know having genetic earl's donlos that's not enough to cause chronic fatigue syndrome there's something else that's being missed and i'm trying to really hit on um what what is that missing link there so um take for example right so with chronic fatigue syndrome and long covid so i i think there really needs to be some more thought on should the diagnosis of long covid even exist um many patients um maybe even more than 50% i'd say that have chronic fatigue syndrome had a virus at the onset of their illness right so whether they had 
um, influenza or Epstein-Barr or something else, right? They, it's very common that they have um, a virus at the onset of their illness, but there isn't long influenza. There isn't long Epstein-Barr, but why is there long COVID? Is COVID somehow fundamentally different that it's affecting the patient in a way that is totally different from this chronic fatigue syndrome group? And I would argue that it's not, that it's really just a political talking point, um, something that politicians have used to get people to comply with um, policies or talk on a certain political platform. Um, and that's just really not healthy because politics and, and medicine need to stay separate. And we need to focus on what is the medical distinction? What is different about this person from that person that we should label them differently? Um, and just what would triggered that illness, I don't believe that to be sufficient um, because you can have, you can get in a car crash, you can have head trauma, you can have so many th different things. For me, it was a chemical exposure that um, will trigger your chronic fatigue syndrome. But if you're gonna do that, then you might as just say, okay, you're long car accident, right? Or, you know, it, it, it doesn't really make sense. And when you look at the exact biomarkers um, in these populations, so for chronic fatigue syndrome and long COVID, um, it, it's really interesting because there's, there's something to be seen when it comes to the inflammatory biomarkers. So in people with chronic fatigue syndrome, um, people who've had a, very, a short duration of chronic fatigue syndrome, so uh, to get that diagnosis, the minimal amount of time that must have passed having that illness is six months. So people that have had this illness for a very short period of time, say six months to a year or two years, they have very high levels of cytokines. And this is a test that's been done where you can measure these cytokine levels in, in people's blood. It's a particular inflammatory marker. And they're very, very high. They're higher than a healthy person. But in people who've had chronic fatigue syndrome for a long period of time, we see a decrease in these cytokine levels. And in fact, they're less than the control population. So you go from a hyper-inflammatory state to a hypo-inflammatory state over time. And I think there, there are very few medical differences between long COVID and chronic fatigue syndrome, but I think where there are differences can largely be explained by duration. So since it's only, now it's 2024, uh, it's only been a couple of years since COVID hit. Some people are still getting COVID. So anyone with long COVID has not had it more than a couple of years. That, that is the most that somebody's ever had it. Um, so I think it really takes more time to see, okay, these people with long COVID and chronic fatigue syndrome, the overlap is almost perfectly matching now. And, you know, it might take a decade or, or longer to, to get there. Um, but, um, the, the mechanism for this illness that I'm proposing is is based on these environmental exposures. And I'm, I'm gonna use one particular type of exposure as an example. So say a VOC. VOC stands for volatile organic chemical, right? So that's something that off gases from plastics, it can come from fragrances, it can come from paint. It's really one of many chemicals that people are exposed to on a daily basis that are extremely hazardous, extremely toxic, and there's virtually zero regulation in this area, um, which is very concerning. So if you have a healthy cell and it is exposed to this environmental toxin, it becomes damaged in some way. That damage obviously depends on what that toxin is. They can have totally different mechanisms. Uh, so it is very varied, but, uh, in the instance that the person that was exposed to that toxin is somebody who has genetics that are hypo hyper proliferative unregulated growth right so when there is damage the body wants to replicate cells to replace those damaged cells to compensate 
and, and fix that damage. And when you have this high rate of cell turnover, that can lead to cancer. Um, if you're somebody that use that their immune system is hyperactive, so the immune system recognizes these damaged cells and say, hey, these don't look healthy, this isn't right, let's uh, phagocytize it and clean it up, right? You can get autoimmunity where the immune system, quote unquote mistakenly, which is not actually mistakenly, will basically eat up these damaged cells. And that's just considered, oh, attacking itself, attacking its own body. And, and so you can get autoimmune diseases. And then where conditions that I'm talking about, like multiple chemical sensitivity and chronic fatigue syndrome, I think there are diseases in which the person has a hypoproliferative response. So there is no compensation with excessive growth and replication to replace those damaged cells. And there's no overactivation of the immune system uh, to, to uh, eat them up so to speak and so you just get like cell death loss of tissue loss of function and and that's what these diseases are and we are we have seen this from uh ron davis and his lab has conducted a study and so he he was particularly studying immune cells in this and so i would like this study to be done on other cell types but at least in these immune cell types, he does see a marketedly increased induction in both apoptotic, which means cells that are dying, and necrotic cell death in stimulated T cells from MECFS patients, which was also associated with disease severity. So in people who have a worse chronic illness, the rate of cells dying is worse. So that's that first line of evidence onto an explanation of the mechanism of the first phase of the induction of these chronic illnesses. So the first phase is all about epithelial barrier damage. Now you might be wondering, what's an epithelial barrier and why is it damaged? So an epithelial barrier is composed of epithelial cells, which are basically skin cells. And these epithelial cells are connected to each other by what's called tight junctions. And so they are all connected in a line and they form a barrier and that barrier is meant to keep things that are outside the body floating around in your environment like toxins and contaminants from getting into your body and making you sick um, and when that barrier is damaged you then become susceptible to those toxins and, and contaminants and this is not a new or novel concept that I'm making up or I'm proposing this is something that's already been established and researched um, However, it's really only been connected to conditions such as allergies and asthma. Now, it, it, it is new to um, connect epithelial barrier damage to chronic conditions like multiple chemical sensitivity and chronic fatigue syndrome and so forth, and that is new. Um, so what, what, what could possibly damage this epithelial barrier? I think there's a number of things that could do it. There's potentially a lot of things. Uh, three different factors that I'd like to focus on are number one, chemical exposures, so pesticides, paint, whatever chemicals can damage the, these cells and, and these junctions. Viral infections, so SARS-CoV-2 is a respiratory virus, and so that will certainly affect epithelial cells in your lungs. And then there's also connective tissue disorders, so if you have a known established connective tissue disease, um, connective tissue is basically a scaffolding. And scaffolding orients cells um, um, next to each other. And if that orientation isn't proper, then they can't form junctions properly. And so that can cause barrier damage. So this barrier keeps toxins that are supposed to be outside the body from getting in. And if that's damaged, you become environmentally susceptible. Now, conditions like environmental sensitivity, multiple chemical sensitivity, um, a sensitivity is something where uh, basically it's saying you have a very minute, small, maybe negligible toxic exposure and it's 
inherently not harmful very much or at all to you but there's a problem in your awareness that that exposure is happening and that it is a problem and your fear or heightened awareness of that exposure is causing you symptoms like something like anxiety inducing um, that's not at all the case so normally when people think of multiple chemical sensitivity even in the chronic illness community they think of oh i i smelled some perfume and i broke out in in rashes or i got a headache that that's not at all the case so you can have a chronic health issue from a single exposure or you can be exposed to numerous things and have symptoms chronically without being aware of what's making you sick and it doesn't have to just include rashes or something else so um if your body cannot heal or remove the toxins that you've inhaled or ingested then those symptoms stay with you even after you leave the exposure event or if you're in a living environment which most people are that has so many toxins so you could have toxins from detergent and perfumes and fragrances and varnish um, and and paint and off-gassing plastics and fire retardant etc cetera, etc cetera, that um, it becomes virtually impossible to distinguish and identify what's affecting you and what's making you sick and the the damage can be very long lasting or permanent so you can leave that exposure area and not feel better um, and so that's really what happened with me where I just thought oh I have chronic fatigue syndrome I'm sick all the time and we don't know what's causing it and it's not until the symptoms became abundantly clear when I moved to a new living space and um, the exposures were significantly higher and I could tell every time you know I walked in a certain room that sim those symptoms got worse that it became obvious and and moving so many times to so many places that I was able to identify what's causing my symptoms even if they were um, chronic so a, a lot of people with for example long COVID in in the community are coming forward and they're starting to notice sensitivities um, and and saying things like Oh, I started noticing I had this problem with molds. Like I went over to my friend's place and it, it was particularly moldy and, and I wasn't feeling good there. So they're starting to notice some environmental sensitivities. But if we understand that barrier damage is at the root of these sensitivities, then we understand that you can't just be quote unquote sensitive to mold which is something that everybody knows about and talked about very frequently, and not other things that are contaminating the air, such as VOCs, and I'll talk about later on nanoparticles. Um, so I, I, I think it, if, if we understand that, okay, barrier damage is occurring and you are affected in this way, then you must be susceptible to, to these um, exposure events. Now I would like to propose to you a model that explains how somebody who never had multiple chemical sensitivity can then develop the condition and somebody who already had multiple chemical sensitivity can get much worse over time especially with repeated exposures so now in this model we're gonna simplify everything down now we know that every person in the country in their home is exposed to some amount of VOCs on a daily basis, whether it's from cleaning chemicals or varnish or off-gassing plastics or whatever. And we'll consider that amount to be relatively constant on a daily basis, okay? And we're gonna simplify this down to four molecules of VOCs that one person will inhale in a 24 hour period. Obviously it's much more, but we're simplifying and quantifying it. And that person who's exposed to those VOCs, those VOCs come in contact with their epithelial barrier as we already discussed. Now to simplify the epithelial barrier as well, we'll assume four epithelial cells that are all lined up and connected to each other. So if those 
four epithelial cells come in contact with four molecules of VOCs, then the ratio is one VOC molecule per epithelial cell. Now, when it's at that quote unquote low level, um, each cell is able to detoxify these VOCs or the level is low enough that it doesn't impede functions or even if it does impede functions or um, say some of the cells even die off, that the body is able to replicate, uh, replace and repair that damage so that that person doesn't lose function. However, if that epithelial barrier then becomes damaged, there is some traumatic damaging event, whether that be a viral exposure, whether that be from a large chemical exposure or whatever it could might be, and that barrier is damaged. So that person, instead of having those four functioning healthy epithelial cells, they only have two. Now, the amount of VOCs that somebody inhales on a daily basis, we're assuming is constant, right? It's that same quote unquote low level. So they're still inhaling four molecules of VOCs. Now, then the ratio becomes two molecules of VOCs per one healthy functioning epithelial cell. And then that exposure level hits this threshold where those two cells aren't able to either detoxify those VOCs or those cells lose their normal function because it's overwhelmed with these two these toxins that it's too much for them now as a result those cells then the the two remaining cells then become either dysfunctional or they die off on their own so after another 24 hours of exposure instead of having two epithelial cells the person then loses them and they have zero healthy functioning epithelial cells. And in this model, the person never had any, you know, significantly large exposure event or uh, the daily exposures they had in their home didn't change, it didn't increase, it stayed the same. But because their body's ability to compensate, heal, and detoxify decreased, the toxicity increased. As the toxicity increases, the damage increases, which then further increases the toxicity. So this is a problem that can uh, start all of a sudden or it can progress over time and get worse. And it all relates to the healthy functioning of this ever so important epithelial barrier. In this section, I'm gonna go into a bit about the different types of things that you could be exposed to and what the differences are between those exposures and, and how they can affect you. Uh, so in the last section, I spoke about this being this condition being a state of damage. So this is not an allergic reaction. This is not an autoimmune disease or anything like that. So um, certainly, depending on you know what you're exposed to and so forth, um, there can be immunological abnormalities. So you can get mast cell activation. You can get, um, you know, inflammatory markers, but that's something downstream. And that's also dependent upon your genetics and what you're exposed to. That's, it's not a necessary requirement that you must have mast cell activation to have chemical sensitivity because you don't necessarily need that. You don't need to have mast cell activation to have chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia. And that's something that's talked about a lot. And there's certainly a correlation, but it, it's not a requirement. Uh, something people don't realize is that mast cell activation is something that's always downstream of barrier permeability. Barrier permeability always comes first. Um, so if you try mast cell stabilizers or steroids, for some people, it can be helpful, but at best, it's definitely not a cure. Um, and for most people, it does nothing. For myself, taking steroids was 
awful. It was a horrible experience. That was probably the worst thing I've ever tried. Uh, so I so certainly don't recommend uh, people take that. Um, and we, we can see evidence that, you know, this is a, uh, this is a real physiological condition. This is not a problem with neurosensitization. You can see physical signs of this intolerance. Um, and uh, I have a photo here where I had a Band-Aid that I left on my skin after, you know, I had a, um, a punch biopsy done. And it was just a standard normal Band-Aid with adhesive. And after 24 hours, I had to remove the Band-Aid because around where the adhesive was, my skin just started falling off and it's even left a scar. And I've used hundreds and thousands of Band-Aids in my lifetime. I've never had a problem with it before. This is something entirely new. And if it was a neurosensitization problem, you wouldn't see my skin being totally intolerant to um, you know the adhesive and it's not an immu immunological response there's there's no rash there's no redness there's no it's not raised or itchy it's just the skin doesn't work anymore the adhesive is toxic to the skin the skin falls off and die it, it, it doesn't work so uh, it's just one example of how this is a true damaging state this is not a neurological or autoimmune process going on um, and I also highly advise against the DNRS program if you've ever heard of it that's something that's been going around in the community for a few years now and um, I it has helped some people somewhat um, I think because um, you know, a lot of people who go through a really traumatic experience with a chronic health issue, they have really high anxiety. And that anxiety doesn't have symptoms of the disease, but it can make the disease worse. So, um, you know, over activation of the nervous system, clenching, tensing, uh, inability to rest, those are all associated with anxiety. So anxiety, the anxiety itself doesn't have symptoms, but the anxiety can worsen a condition. And I think DNRS may help some people with anxiety, but if you're not dealing with anxiety, this won't help you. And in fact, you can get substantially worse from trying this program. Um, I'm one of those people. So when I had moved into a new apartment that was triggering new symptoms for me, I used the DNRS program to try to, you know, cope and adapt and adjust. And uh, as a result of that, I stayed in that apartment and I stayed in that exposure area um, significantly longer than I should have or would have otherwise. And uh, I'm now dealing with permanent physical debilitating conditions uh, and symptoms because, of, because I thought that, okay, if I just calm my mind and cope, that that would help with the exposures. And it does not. Uh, avoidance is absolutely critical. The DNRS trains you to do the exact opposite. So I, I highly advise against that. Um, and so now going into, there's three main things that you can be exposed to that I found to be a problem. Um, I think there are certainly other things that you can be exposed to that are, you know, problematic, but significantly less so. Um, so I'm just focusing on the three big ones, the three main ones. So mold. Right, so I moved into uh, one of the apartments I moved into, I moved into several in a short period of time. And because of I lived in all these different living environments, uh, each living environment came with a different set of symptoms. And if it was just a neural sensitization issue, I would have the same symptoms regardless of what I'm exposed to, but my symptoms were totally different. Uh, and that's because there was a susceptibility 
to these toxins happening, uh, susceptibility to these contaminants happening. It wasn't a neurological, primary neurological issue. So um, with mold, you can get flu-like symptoms, a lot of malaise just feeling really icky. Uh, you can get, you won't actually run a fever, which is weird, um, but you'll feel feverish. Uh, that partly may be attributed to people with chronic fatigue syndrome tend to run a lower temperature. So if you know the normal temperature is 98.6, somebody with CFS might run 97.6. They tend to run a bit cooler. Uh, so even if you get you know a fever, right, uh, and you're up to like 98.6, that's that's normal, but for you, that's hot. Um, but you'll feel feverish, like you'll you you'll just feel flush, you'll feel hot, and then this type of vascular pain. It's very difficult to describe, but it's like the only way I could describe it is like if the arteries going straight up into my brain were all rock solid, stiff, and inflamed, uh, and you can kind of feel that that vascular inflammation, like when you move your head, and it's very difficult to explain, but these symptoms are associated with mold exposure. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, with mold is actually not the worst problem that you can have because mold, you, you can clean, you can filter it, you can get rid of it. Um, you know, so I had a, a mold problem in one apartment that uh, I was I was able to get rid of the mold. Um, I had you know used some various techniques that a uh, lot just a lot of cleaning that I was able to to get rid of it. So uh, it can be very toxic. It can be very bad for you, and I I don't want to discount that. But um, you know, given the choice, I would rather be exposed to mold than some other things. There can be things that are worse. So the second category, the second category of things that I want to discuss. So VOCs, I spoke about this earlier, stands for volatile organic chemicals, VOCs. And when you're exposed to VOCs, you get this very stimulated feeling, kind of like you're on drugs. Like it's like, your eyes get wide open, you get short of breath, and you're just like, it's very stimulating, but it's not a good feeling. Um, and then you'll feel kind of like a compression in your chest, like, like your chest is like deflated. And then you get this inability to rest and relax. And you'll, you'll kind of go, and it won't do any, like you don't feel any sensation of rest or relax. Um, and that's what VOCs do. And when you leave that environment, so you might feel when, when you're currently exposed to VOCs and like I said, you get a little bit of a stimulated feeling, you might feel actually, depending on what the VOCs are, you might feel okay actually in that living environment. But as soon as you walk out and you leave that living environment, you go outside you can actually feel substantially worse because you just, you crash. Your nervous system is overworking to compensate for the damage the VOCs are causing. So when you leave that environment, your nervous system just totally crashes. And VOCs, um, I, I think, are a big contributor to epithelial barrier damage. Um, even if you... Uh, that damage was caused by, like I said, a connective tissue problem or a virus or whatever, being exposed to those VOCs will be damaging no matter what your genetics are. It will always be harmful. So if you do have some sort of damage to this barrier that isn't caused by VOCs, but you're exposed to even quote unquote low levels of VOCs, that can prevent that barrier from being able to heal. So you may be affected by these VOCs, even if that wasn't the thing that caused you to get sick in the first place. I'm very excited to go into the final category of major exposures that affect human health and contribute to chronic diseases. This category specifically applies to chronic fatigue syndrome, POTS, and fibromyalgia. 
Now, this is, category is something entirely new and novel that I'm proposing is a major driver of disease. So you can go to any doctor, any researcher, even any environmental specialist. They will not bring up this category ex of exposure and they might not even know what it is. So I'm going to be talking much more in detail about this type of exposure in the second half of my video today, but I'd like to at least bring it up and mention it uh, briefly in terms of what the feelings are and how it has affected my health. This category is insoluble nanoparticles. So you may have heard the term nanoparticles before, but it might apply to either toxic reactive substances, such as lead and mercury, or it might apply to nanoparticles that are in plastics, so microplastics. Microplastics is at a scale that's much, much greater and higher than the nanoparticles that I'm talking about today are. Specifically, I would like to focus on titanium dioxide. Now, there are other similar types of nanoparticles that might apply as well, and this includes silica, calcium carbonate, um, and um, uh, aluminum oxide, and these are relatively inert, unreactive particles. So it's basically like a grain of sand, but multiple scales smaller. Now, these are substances that um, I believe are clogging, tearing, and impeding blood flow. And it's something that can cause pain and fatigue. You'll get a feeling of fullness and pressure in your body as these inter stitial spaces in your body are clogged and it's going to increase pain as it damages your connective tissue and nerves can be either punctured or torn apart and it'll leave you feeling really clogged and heavy like there's cement in your blood because that's pretty much what it is now if you can picture something like getting sand in your body that sand isn't going to be very reactive. It's not going to poison you, but with a lot of movement and pressure, we know that it's an abrasive and it can clog up places in your body and it can tear tissue apart. And so it's something that's extremely common. So um, every, almost every building and home in the entire country uses these nanoparticles like silica and titanium dioxide in paint that's on the walls. So I'm gonna go into detail about what effects these particles have, uh, what I think the evidence is, and what you can do about it later in this video. But I'd just like to bring it up as one of the three major um, sources of exposure. Uh, and then if I can get into a bit uh, about the VOC exposure more as well, because that is something that is a major contributor to this, this barrier damage that is in our first phase of this disease induction. Uh, so I have some photos here that I'd like to share with you uh, that I had back uh, several years ago, a chest CT done. And this chest CT came back normal and the radiologist marked it as everything fine. And I looked at it more and studied it more uh, comparing it to, you know, just other images on the internet of other normal, healthy chest CT scans. And the more I looked at it, the more it didn't look normal. Um, and what I was seeing is, is there's this space, uh, and I took images kind of highlighting the area where the thymus is. So the thymus is right under um, the, 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 where your ribs are, right under that chest bone. And that space where the thymus sits, there should be a good gap, and there isn't that gap. Uh, for me, it is very, very, very small. Um, the thymus looks totally squished. Uh, the thymus can be in different shapes, that does happen. And uh, although the thymus being affected could have effects to the lymphatic and immune system, um, I don't believe that's 
that's the primary problem. I think the primary problem we're getting here is uh, this barrier damage, this barrier susceptibility. And so if your chest is compressed by VOC exposure, which I don't think this is like a congenital condition, like something I was born with, I think this is something that developed and occurred because of chemical exposures. And if, if you're getting this chest compression, so uh, there is a disease out there called uh, thoracic outlet syndrome where uh, compression in the chest can compress nerves and, and blood vessels and affect the rest of the body. And it's, and it's possible that that's a, uh, you know, uh, um, having effects in this disease to, uh, you know, a lesser extent. I don't think that's the cause of everything. But um, this can put pressure on the thoracic duct, which is the main duct that controls your lymphatic system that clears out waste and, and impair lymphatics. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more uh, shortly in this video. And, but this area where the, where the chest and, and lungs are and the throat, um, this is very highly innervated by the vagus nerve. And so I'm sure the vagus nerve is something you've all heard of before, but the vagus nerve lies underneath this protective barrier layer. And if the barrier is damaged, then the vagus nerve can be exposed. And so the vagus nerve can then be very easily damaged by uh, further chemical exposures. Um, so that will affect your ability to rest, recover, relax, regenerate, and so forth. The vagus nerve is obviously very important. Um, and I think what we're seeing here is that that compression of the, t of the chest is a result of uh, where these barrier cells which is basically a buffer to the body, either die or lose function, and that area then becomes compressed. So um, if, if a human being is going to be exposed to some sort of toxin, right, the body has developed multiple ways to protect itself. And um, it wants the nervous system to be the safest thing. Like your nervous system is, very important it controls a lot of functions you want to protect that as best you can so i think that uh the body has these epithelial cells as a buffer right so like in the game of chess they're like pawns we want those to die first to protect the queen but once you lose all your pawns your queen then becomes very vulnerable and susceptible uh so that's my analogy that i'm using and uh, furthermore, uh, another thing about barrier damage, I'm primarily talking about air quality and effects in the chest and lungs when it comes to barrier integrity. But like I said earlier, the gastrointestinal tract also has a, its own barrier. And so you can get barrier permeability problems with your gut as well. And I think one sign of that uh, many people in the POTS and CFS world have heard of these cell trend uh, adrenergic autoantibodies. So this is something that a few years back uh, came out. It was like this big thing. Everybody was talking about it. All these ME-CFS and POTS people had these um, adrenergic autoantibodies, but nobody knew what to make of it. Nobody knew what it meant. And, you know, it kind of got... Um, you know, put on the back burner, but actually a lot of people have been studying it um, over the years. And I, I think it's really interesting. There's this paper that came out a couple of years ago that had a potential explanation for what those autoantibodies meant. And it says, autoantibodies in ME-CFS patients is being directed at microbial molecules translocated from the host GI tract. So, um, it, 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 it goes on further to say these translated microorganisms that express these beta-2 adrenergic uh, antibodies may elicit autoantibodies cross-reacting with the host's own adrenergic receptors. So 
that that's very interesting so it's saying that uh you know i can't say for sure if this is true but i think this is a a good explanation that fits in with the mechanism that i've outlined which is if there is permeability in in the barrier in your gastrointestinal tract these bacteria cells that are in your gi tract they can leak these antigens through that barrier through that barrier in your gut and then when your immune system recognizes it it produces antibodies against those that cross react with adrenergic receptors that you have in the rest of your body and so these uh, cell trend autoantibodies may just actually be a marker of barrier permeability. Excellent. So now we're on to the second phase, talking about the induction of these chronic illnesses. So the second phase primarily applies to people who have developed chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. So the fatigue and pain, uh, this is pretty important for. I spoke uh, in my last section a little bit about nanoparticles and the problems with those and I'd like to now go more deeply into that because I believe this is a major problem driving uh, the whole mechanism of, the, of this disease that these conditions are the result of nanoparticle exposure that is the primary underlying uh, driver of those conditions of that pathology and I have a lot of reasoning and evidence that plays to that and that I'd like to talk about so I think that exposure to these insoluble nanoparticles such as titanium dioxide that I've mentioned it results in connective tissue damage impaired perfusion and clogged lymphatics I think these are three things that are going on uh, and I'm going to try to provide support for that as much as possible. Um, but basically when patients complain that, oh, it feels like there's cement in my blood, which is something people with chronic fatigue syndrome have, have said many times. It doesn't just feel like that because there's something wrong with you and it's just a feeling. It feels like that because you're actually more or less right that these insoluble nanoparticles are essentially something solid, crystalline, uh, that is literally in your body, in your blood, that's affecting you and causing your symptoms. So you're not really wrong when you make that comparison. Uh, I'm focusing on, for the duration of this video, titanium dioxide specifically. However, I just want to make it clear that the problem is not just with titanium dioxide and nothing else. I think titanium dioxide's a big problem, uh, but it, it it's not the only nanoparticle there is. So there's various other types of nanoparticles, um, but I'm focusing on anything that ends with oxide, really. So that's titanium dioxide, silicon dioxide, aluminum oxide and this isn't really an oxide but uh, calcium carbonate so these are all in relatively insoluble nanoparticles that are chemically inert but are abrasive um, so titanium dioxide is a substance that is found almost everywhere in everything uh, so it's in paint it's in toothpaste, it's in tattoos, it's in sunscreen, it's used even in food. Uh, you can find it in candy, chocolates, cakes, etc. It's used in paper and pills. So it, it's really all over the place in our environment. And uh, if you were to look at a tube of toothpaste and on some of the tubes of toothpaste, it'll say what the function of each ingredient is at, you know if it if it's a good company that that they're honest and if you look at what is titanium dioxide so it can be used as a whitening agent but it's also used in toothpaste because it's an abrasive it's something that has a scrubbing mechanism um, and that's what I think is essentially happening inside our bodies that these particles are acting as 
uh, you know, has a scrubbing mechanism that it's physically slowly digging and tearing away at, at connective tissue and nerves and so forth. Um, and so to explain, uh, I, I, the reason that I'm focusing on titanium dioxide, well, several reasons. Number one, that it's so commonly used. Uh, but number two, it has a very long half-life. So when I say half-life, that is the amount of time it takes for half of the substance to be removed from and extruded from the body. Um, in some reports, the half-life can be slow with, you know, could be, you know, a few weeks or so forth. Uh, but uh, I found some reports saying that 60 to 70 days is a common half-life for titanium dioxide. However, uh, it needs to be made clear that the half-life actually depends upon what the exposure level is. So if you have a very minute exposure, the half-life will be pretty quick and you'll remove it from the body relatively quickly, easily. But if you have a very large exposure event, the half-life can jump from days to years. So this is something that'll stay in the body for an extremely, extremely long time, if not, you know, forever, uh, depending upon how much you're exposed to, but also the composition of the nanoparticles, the size of the nanoparticles, the shape, uh, they can be functionalized, um, you know, and also whether they're agglomerated or individual particles that you've inhaled can be have an effect. All these things can can play into, uh, you know, the exact mechanism. And and I think that's one contributor why, uh, among amongst this chronic disease population, symptoms are so varied and heterogeneous. It's it's really all over the place. Um, and I think part of it, like I said, depends upon how much you're exposed to, what type of nanoparticles you're exposed to, where they end up in your system, and, and, and so forth. Um, and these nanoparticles are, are a major problem because of all the things I've been exposed to, right? I've, I've gotten sick from being exposed to smoke. I've gotten sick from being exposed to mold. I've gotten sick from being exposed to VOCs. The nanoparticles are the only exposure event that I've had that I don't feel better when I leave that exposure area. So I can feel either the same or continue to get worse even when I'm in an environment where there's no nanoparticles or ver very few in the air whatsoever. So it's something that it stays inside your body, uh, doesn't leave for a long time, but also the damage can accumulate. So the damage, even if the number of particles decreases over time, the damage will accumulate. You don't heal well from it. Um, so that's why I think it's one of the biggest problems. And nanoparticles is something that's um, virtually never been mentioned in the MCS, CFS, or fibromyalgia world whatsoever. Uh, any doctor or researcher in the fibromyalgia world will say this is a neurological issue where you have a heightened pain response. You don't have a heightened pain response. You're being physically damaged, right? Um, and there have been, uh, for example, the EFSA panel on food additives has specifically stated that gastrointestinal absorption of titanium dioxide particles is low and in other literature uh, they've had more of a focus on uh, the respiratory system as being the primary pathway of um, exposure to titanium dioxide nanoparticles so these these particles are something that absorb not very well if you ingest it but extremely well if you inhale it um, but if you have a problem with barrier permeability, then it's likely that even ingesting these particles uh, it can be a problem and it can absorb much easier that way. 
Um, so that's why I'm focusing on you know air quality being being an issue. But uh, Michigan State University has said in, in industrial settings, people can be exposed to titanium dioxide through inhalation. Inhalational exposure to titanium dioxide is exceedingly rare for most people. This is absolutely false. This is not true. Uh, so matte white paint is the primary source I have found of exposure to titanium dioxide nanoparticles which is in virtually every house and building in the country. Where you see matte white paint, there's gonna be these nanoparticles in the air, it's gonna be a problem. So when these nanoparticles, when these particles, when you get larger ones, like uh, microparticles, right? They can float in the air for a few hours, but they'll eventually settle to the ground. These nanoparticles are so small that they'll continuously circulate around in the air, they'll float around in the air, they will never settle. They're so small that they'll never settle on the ground. So if you get this stuff in an environment, in a living environment where it's in the air, you basically can't get it out of the air. It, it stays in the air. Um, so it, it, it's a major, major issue that we're constantly being exposed to every time you go into, you know, virtually any building with central air, right? There's going to be some sort of painting, uh, most likely with this matte white paint somewhere in the building. It's gonna go through these air vents and it's just gonna keep circulating in that building forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, and so I think what Michigan State University is saying with this comment is that what is rare is exposure to titanium dioxide nanoparticles that's high enough to cause acute symptoms in healthy people okay so um, the problem is for people in this chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia world there are people who are susceptible remember they have this barrier damage first if that barrier integrity is compromised, then you become particularly susceptible to inhalation absorption of these nanoparticles. And when the amount of these nanoparticles get high, we found that they are removed from the body at a slow rate. And if you're continuously exposed, the levels of titanium dioxide nanoparticles you have will likely increase over time. Virtually every single person in the entire country has some level of titanium dioxide nanoparticles in their body. That is an unavoidable truth. It's so common, uh, it's so easily absorbed that virtually everyone's gonna have it to a degree. And uh, what I've said about matte white paint, an analogy that I, I can use to help explain how this becomes a problem is if you were to take a piece of construction paper and you were to coat that construction paper with a glue stick and you were to take a handful of sand and throw it on the construction paper and it sticks because of the, you know, you rub the glue stick on it and you hang it on the wall, you come back in a year's time, you'd probably expect maybe 50% of the sand is still there, 50% of it has fallen off. And on a microscopic and nanoscopic level, that's exactly what's happening when you have this matte white paint in your house. There are these tiny, tiny little particles on the surface of that paint that you cannot see. It's way, multiple levels too small to see. But as air circulates in the room and so forth, these particles fall off, they get in the air, you inhale it, you now have this abrasive running through your blood, running through your whole body, damaging you. Um, so that's that's my uh, that's what I found is the biggest source of contamination and the biggest problem is this matte white paint. Uh, and there also has been a study showing uh, this titanium dioxide exposure induces this chronic fatigue syndrome like illness in mice without um, any major structural or blood based biomarker changes at lower doses. So it's something that is not reactive. This is a relatively inert substance. But so so you're you're not able to find any type of 
biomarker abnormality of what's going on, what's being affected, because it's not reactive, but it's inducing this chronic fatigue syndrome like illness. Uh, and that that's why your your tests keep coming back normal is because this substance is relatively inert um, and so these these mice that are exposed to titanium dioxide they've shown symptoms such as uh, passive behavior loss of appetite tremors and lethargy and um, you know we need real studies to be done to see is this happening in people what what does it look like when a person's exposed because they can vocalize and explain their symptoms better and i think what what you get is literally chronic fatigue syndrome that's what's happening to people so um you know you can be living in a, a living environment so you're living in one of those newer modern apartment buildings that's painted with matte white paint and it's got a lot of these nanoparticles in the air and you're relatively unaffected because a, only a small amount is getting in your system and becoming problematic. But then you get effect, infected with COVID, it affects your, your barrier integrity, and then these particles get in your system, make you sick, and you develop quote unquote long COVID. Um, so I'm gonna go talk into a little bit more of how these nanoparticles affect you and uh, supporting evidence of why I think this is what's happening we're going to get into how titanium dioxide is affecting and causing these chronic illnesses what what's the mechanism of that <clears throat> so first I want to talk about how it can make chemical sensitivity worse so num by number one is direct damage to the epithelial barrier by there are what's called metalloproteinases so this is something that degrades collagen and connective tissue these are enzymes that do that um, and they can degrade the junction proteins that hold these cells together that form the epithelial barrier uh, this is something MMP activation is something Jeff Wood has talked about Jeff Wood is somebody who's quote-unquote recovered from CFS and POTS following uh, CCI surgery um, so it, uh, that that's something Jeff has implicated as the cause of the CCI he developed. So um, he's, he's claiming that these metalloproteinases can degrade collagen and cause weakness in this connective tissue, uh, but he wasn't quite clear on what would cause this MMP activation. And I think titanium dioxide could certainly be something that's doing that. Um, number two is impairment of lymphatics. So um titanium dioxide will clog up it will reside in lymph nodes and it can just clog up lymphatics and lymphatics are important for clearing out waste if you can't clear out waste that weights builds up uh number three would be an increase in oxidative stress so titanium dioxide has been shown to increase in numerous studies oxidative stress uh and if you have an increase in oxidative stress levels then quote unquote small chemical exposures that also increase oxidative stress will add to something that's already a problem for you it'll exacerbate it and make it worse and so it'll hit that breaking point where your body can't keep up with oxidative stress and the damage that it does and number four is impairment of liver function so um uh, other than lymphatics, the primary place that titanium dioxide likes to reside is in the liver. So if the liver is affected and liver is important in detoxifying uh, chemicals, then that's going to affect your ability to detoxify and um, going to make your chemical sensitivity worse. And that's why a lot of people who have chronic fatigue syndrome find that they can't drink alcohol anymore. They're totally intolerant to alcohol. Um, but as I said before, I, I believe that the primary mechanism of this pathology resides in titanium dioxide being mechanically damaging as opposed to toxic or reactive like lead and mercury, something like that. Um, and 
I, I base this off a lot of personal experience um, from really focusing on and paying attention to my symptoms. Uh, I have this chronic arm pain and I notice a worsening in this arm pain and weakness that's not triggered necessarily by muscle use, but from mechanical stress. So if there's straining, stretching, uh, flexing, or mechanical pressure, like for example, you know, putting weight on it. And uh, it, it affects me enough that when I go to sleep at night, I have to use a sheet lifter. So they're like metal bars and I actually will have them over my body to hold the weight of the bed sheets off me because just the weight of the bed sheets uh, will exacerbate my symptoms significantly and, and make the pain and weakness worse. So I have to keep that weight off. And uh, I, I really think that is a sign of mechanical uh, damage, mechanical issues, connective tissue issues, because, um, you know, normally connective tissue is supposed to protect your nerves and blood vessels and so forth. And if that connective tissue is damaged, then adding mechanical pressure will put pressure on nerves and blood vessels. Your body won't be able to uh, protect, protect those adequately. Another point that I have about this being mechanically damaging is that the damage appears to be indiscriminate. So there are, amongst the symptoms I have and others have as well, there are skin abnormalities. So psoriasis, alopecia, like I said, skin falling off, uh, a lot more cracking in the skin and so forth. There's skin abnormalities, right? Dermo dermatological abnormalities. Then there's like pain that's like burning. We have burning, pain, tingling. Those are all neurological symptoms, so the nerves are affected. We have soreness. I'm extremely sore. That That's a major issue I have. And soreness is not a neuro neurological issue. Soreness is a mus muscular issue, so the muscles are affected. Um, I also notice I have... Um, Following my exposure to titanium dioxide uh, in an apartment I moved into, I have a change in the tension that I feel when I extend my arm. So that extension limit is different following that exposure. Um, and in addition to that, needing, as I said earlier, sheet lifters to keep the weight off because I can't handle the me mechanical pressure. I think both of those say that there is structural connective tissue damage occurring. Uh, then we have uh, things like microbleeds and large capillaries, which I will show later on. That's indicating vascular damage. So the, it's really indiscriminate how many different parts of the body is are being affected by uh, you know in, in this condition. So I I think for it to be indiscriminately damaging to structural. Uh, to structural things, uh, vascular, nerves, etc., for it to be affecting everything, you're not gonna have just like, for example, one autoantibody, right? For it to affect everything like that, I think it needs to be some more, some indiscriminate mechanical damage that's occurring. Uh, and the damage that occurs is very quickly. So I don't think it is, um, you know, connective tissue is affected because of low metabolism. Like there's a me metabolic effect on collagen production. I, I don't think that's it because the rate of damage is extremely quickly. I can go from relatively okay to having, you know, sudden permanent muscle pain or weakness in an area um, almost immediately. And so it's, it's not gonna be a metabolic issue. There is some structural weakness or susceptibility. Um, and I also think with chronic VOC exposure affecting collagen producing cells, that the body can't initiate fibrotic mechanisms to compensate and protect from nanoparticle induced damage. So that same type of damage from VOCs that's affecting your epithelial barrier, it's affecting these epithelial cells that are also collagen producing cells. They're also structural producing cells. So when your barrier is damaged in a particular way, 
that can also impair your body's ability to produce more collagen to compensate for the damage these nanoparticles are then doing. Um, so this is basically, I, I think of it as like full body silicosis without fibrosis. That's how I think about this. So chronic fatigue syndrome is an anti-fibrotic disease. And uh, things like viral and pathogen persistence in long COVID, I think it, um, you know, I, I, there, there's a lot of research in this area like Polybio is doing on, you know, hidden viruses and hidden pathogens. And I think people are way too focused on that. I think, uh, you know, the microbiome is somewhat important and, you know, in some diseases can play a big role. Um, but I, I think it's really an ancillary point. Um, I think that if your immune system, you know, glial cells or whatever are affected by these nanoparticles uh, and also VOC exposure, that is going to make it easier for some viruses and bacteria and pathogens that, you know, just normally are in the body to overproduce. And, you know, you, you can get symptoms and effects and changes as a result, but I'm trying to make the point clear that that's not the primary problem. If we're going to really improve patients' quality of life, if we're going to really help a lot of people, we have to start at the very top that this is um, an environmentally induced disease. There can be immunological effects, there can be neurological effects, there can be uh, microbiome effects, but they're all downstream of these primary uh, environmental exposures. I'd like to now share with you some photos and personal experiences that I have that are supporting evidence of the proposal that titanium dioxide is at the root of a lot of these diseases. So I have some photos shown here of a study that was done that showed that titanium dioxide exposure results in separation of muscle fibers. And it does this by the same mechanism that I outlined earlier in my video, where titanium dioxide will block or degrade junction proteins that hold cells together. And I discussed this as something that could potentially impair barrier integrity. But what it's also going to do is impair, impair junctions in general. So most of the cells in your body are held together in tissue and, it, and the cells are able to hold together with junction proteins, they're, they're very important. And so titanium dioxide is a substance that strongly impairs these junctions. And so you, you get separation. Um, and I, I believe that I'm seeing this uh, with some of the photos that I have. So you can see the skin on my hand. Um, and this photo was taken, uh, the first photo on the left was taken about a month after my exposure to nanoparticles that caused my fibromyalgia type pain and weakness. And you can see that there are these deep lines and they're not cracks from dry skin. Uh, the lines look really underneath the skin, very deep underneath the skin. And um, I believe this is evidence, these striations is evidence of this cellular separation. And uh, one year after that exposure event happened, um, these striations become less pronounced. So it's something that uh, significantly impacted the body uh, immediately. And over time, the body was able to somewhat compensate for this problem. Um, it would be really interesting to see, you know, two years after the exposure event, how this plays out, but this is the evidence that I have thus far. Uh, the other problem that I have is that uh, I believe these, it's also causing blood vessel leakage. And so I have these photos shown where um, uh, on my arms specifically, I'll get these very pronounced red dots. I'll wake up with them every morning. It's something that's become less pronounced over time, but 
um, definitely immediately after exposure, um, I was like, what's what's going on? What is this? And I've had several people say to me, oh, it's just, you know, it's some sort of rash. It's some sort of mast cell thing. It's not a rash. It's not a mast cell thing. Um, it's not raised. It's not itchy. It's It doesn't look like any allergic reaction or anything I've ever had. It's just like red skin and it's like red underneath the skin. And I think what you're getting here is blood vessel leakage, some like micro bleeding. Um, and titanium dioxide has been shown in one of these studies that it causes endothelial, which is like blood vessels, cell leakage by disrupting this cadherin, which is one of those junction proteins interactions. So um, these are multiple lines of evidence supporting why titanium dioxide is really at the root of things. Brain fog is a chief complaint of almost everyone with chronic fatigue syndrome and other related chronic illnesses. So what's causing this brain fog? What's the mechanism of that? Well, I think we are seeing evidence of the impact of titanium dioxide nanoparticles in MRI imaging of people with these conditions. And on my own MRI report and others with chronic fatigue syndrome that I've seen and heard of, there are found these hyper intensities in the white matter region of the brain. So these white matter intensities are non-specific, which means it's not associated with any particular disease state. And for the most part, researchers don't quite know what it is. They can't quite explain what that means. Um, and so I think what's going on is that these titanium dioxide nanoparticles, they clog up areas. So they'll reside in interstitial spaces, so spaces between cells, and they'll kind of clog up that area. And what happens when you have increased pressure is that it can stretch out this area, right? So it's it's a mechanical force. This is something mechanically damaging. And if the brain isn't getting adequate perfusion, it'll try to increase blood flow and that will just increase pressure. And you'll get areas of the brain that have um, stretching. And that's what these white matter hyperintensities are, are areas of stretching. And the literature supports this as well. So I found this one article that states, uh, we observe a mechanical loading state of the ventricular wall that causes ependymal cells to be stretched thin during each hemodynamic cycle. It goes on to state, the consistent initial appearance as caps in the ventricular horns is strongly indicative of a mechanical contribution to ventricular wall failure. So it's saying that there is mechanical pressure in the brain that's leading to the stretching out of these cells. And the result is these white matter hyperintensities that show up on MRI reports. And this study has nothing to do with chronic fatigue syndrome and it has nothing to do with nanoparticles. It's just explaining what is happening when we see these hyperintensities. So when we're seeing that the this white matter areas are, are stretched thin, if there's mechanical damage, um, of all the things that could possibly cause mechanical damage, I think that these inert abrasive nanoparticles are the most plausible culprit. They make the most sense. I think if there was something like a viral mechanism for this damage to be occurring, it would have to be extremely elaborate to end up with mechanical damage from a chronic viral infection like that. Um, I think direct damage by these nanoparticles leading to areas that are, are stretched thin. I, we're seeing this that they impact the cadherin junction proteins. We're seeing stretching of cells. We're seeing separation of cells. We're seeing leakage of cells. We're and the studies are showing that this is uh, unequivocally a mechanical damage. So I think the combination of everything is very supportive that this is a condition of mechanical damage. 
Um, and then I, I think I can explain this point further. So Dr. Sistrom, he's one of the lead researchers in chronic fatigue syndrome. He's somebody that I've also met in person. Um, he's done a study uh, a little while back that he found impaired peripheral oxygen extraction in MECFS. And I think this is due to impaired accessibility of the blood to reach tissue and oxygenate the tissue. And I think this is a direct blockage because these nanoparticles are occupying the interstitial spaces. And if the nanoparticles are occupying those spaces, then blood and oxygen and nutrients are not. And that is why we're getting impaired oxygen extraction. I think that is my explanation of Dr. System, Systrom's results. In this next section, I will be discussing lymphatic and metabolic dysfunction that's occurring in MECFS. Uh, lymphatic dysfunction is something that's probably also occurring in uh, other chronic illnesses, uh, people with other diagnoses, fibromyalgia and MCS and so forth, uh, but it hasn't been studied in those indications at all. Uh, so that's why I'm focusing on uh, that MECFS subgroup, which, um, you know, again, I, I think MECFS is just one disease state uh, in a bunch of different chronic diseases that are really the same thing. Um, but uh, lymphatic dysfunction is something that Dr. Raymond Perrin studied. He's a osteopathic doctor over in the UK, and I've spoken with him several times. And he's been treating MECFS patients for something like 30 years now using manual lymphatic drainage and have seen really good results. Uh, and he's got, he's labeled his uh, specific protocol for lymphatic massaging, the parent technique. Uh, that's something I tried myself and helped me for quite a while. Um, but uh, he's done, I believe, three clinical studies now, been involved in three clinical studies, and he has proven that there are uh, abnormalities that you can visually see and, and uh, t clinically test for in MECFS patients. And here's a picture of somebody with MECFS that has these engorged lymphatics and uh, normally lymphatics are very small they should be smaller than a, a blood vessel um, but for them to be engorged this large is certainly abnormal and obviously most MECFS patients you don't see them quite this big and obvious but uh, this is um, just proving that the lymphatic system is infected uh, affected in these patients and uh, the lymphatic system is something that's really flown under the radar for quite a long time. Uh, it's only more recently gotten attention and, and research starting to um, happen in that area, uh, which is really odd because the lymphatic system is, is everywhere in the body. Um, everywhere there's blood vessels, there's lymphatic vessels. They're responsible for draining away waste. Um, and they're very critical, uh, but it's at the level of you know 10 years ago if you were go, you, you were to go to a doctor and say hey i think i have a problem with my lymphatic system they'd say what are you talking about what the heck is a lymphatic system and um you know now there's a lot more awareness of it people are starting to do research in that area but um it's something that people haven't been paying attention to that that is very important other than maybe in uh cancer for instance but um, I think this lymphatic dysfunction is related to uh, titanium dioxide exposure. So there's this old study that was done that these rats were exposed to titanium dioxide and the researcher measured uh, titanium dioxide levels in all various organs and found overwhelming, overwhelmingly that um, it would reside in lymph nodes. And so if it's getting clogged in lymph nodes, you know, if, if you think about the lymphatic system as a long hose, and if at the end of the hose, you've got a big clog, that's obviously going to disrupt lymphatic flow through uh, the rest of the lymph vessel. So um, uh, I, I think this is responsible. Uh, and we're also seeing 
um, you know, to provide more support, metabolic disturbances. So here's another study done that uh, this researcher did, uh, took NMR spectras in the blood. So NMR is a method for testing um, for organic acid levels, certain metabolites in the body that are related to energy expenditure and mitochondrial function and so forth. And what they saw in, in these rats that were exposed to titanium dioxide, um, that these organic acid levels, they initially spiked in, in like the first day, and then they uh, quickly declined and uh, chronically persisted at very, very low levels. So this titanium dioxide re exposure resulted in hypometabolic function, and that's something that's been seen in a number of different uh, research studies done in MECFS, and I think this titanium dioxide exposure explains that. I myself have had uh, organic acid testing uh, several times, and um, the vast majority of them uh, are all chronically very, very low, lower than they should be. And I think this titanium dioxide exposure um, explains that. This next topic of discussion is going to be very interesting. So I'm going to be talking about the existence of amyloid fibrin microclots that have been, in the last few years, linked to long COVID and to a lesser extent MECFS. Now, these amyloid fibrin microclots, it's not really clear what they are, how they're forming, and what they're related to. And I think there have been st some studies done that have shown that, okay, they're something relatively nonspecific. Um, they're associated with aging and uh, correlated with damage to cells and cell membranes and things like that. And that may be true, but um, researchers can't really explain the mechanism of how and why they're forming and, and, and what they necessarily mean. Um, and it's been implicated in uh, MECFS because, and long COVID, because if these microclots are impeding blood flow and uh, impeding perfusion, then um, that could result in fatigue and weakness and, and so forth. And so we're trying to figure out what's the significance of it and, and what it means and so forth. Um, you know, Polybio is looking into it pretty heavily um, as it relates to, you know, viral capsids and so forth, but um, I'm taking a different route. I think that these microclots could be directly related to these titanium dioxide nanoparticles that I've been talking about. Um, and I don't know for sure, but I think it is possible and worth investigating if titanium dioxide actually resides at the core of these microclots. So there was a study done and, and published that showed that, um, well, they looked at the interaction of fibrinogen and albumin with titanium dioxide, and it showed that both albumin and fibrinogen, fibrinogen is a precursor of fibrin uh, that is involved in the clotting process, interact irreversibly with the negative surface of titanium dioxide nanoparticles. So if these titanium dioxide nanoparticles are in the blood, if they interact with a molecule of fibrinogen, they'll bind irreversibly. And because these nanoparticles, they're a three-dimensional crystalline substance with shape and mass and so forth, they could possibly bind several molecules of fibrinogen and it basically will form a clump but then not grow any larger than that because there's not an increased level of clotting factors in the blood to induce f further clotting growth. Uh, they're essentially f like fibrinogen clumps uh, and that's how they form and you know that's my theory. Um, but I have had this test done there is a test that looks at, uh, analyzes for the presence of microclots in the blood, and it's primarily used for diagnosing long COVID. 
I do not have long COVID, but I do have the presence of these microclots. And uh, it's really interesting because I've done some other testing that might be related to this. So I've been using a method called nail fold caproloscopy. Uh, it's something that uh, not too many doctors use here in America. It's bigger over in Europe. Uh, mostly rheumatologists use it for diagnosing systemic sclerosis um, and other rheumat rheumatological diseases. But Ron Davis has done some nail fold caproloscopy testing with ME-CFS patients. And, um, you know, I did, I did some, uh, I basically bought my own microscope and I looked at my nail bed and I looked at the capillaries and um, what I did that was different from Ron Davis is that I was, because I had a microscope, you know, in my own house, I was able to look at my nail bed many, many times. I could look at it several times a day over a very long period of time, like six months to a year at multiple times during the day for the same patient. And, you know, I did notice some abnormalities. So I see some uh, enlarged capillaries. Um, they're, it's, they're only periodically enlarged. It's not all of them. It's a small fraction are enlarged, uh, but they are there. And I also see some micro hemorrhages. Uh, they're not all the time in all places, but they're there. Um, but I feel that those are relatively small findings that you know I, I'm not really too focused on. What I think is more interesting is that where there are micro hemorrhages, right? Um, almost always. I will see the presence of these black dots and um, it's not dirt and it's not dust because I don't see them all around all over the sample. I only see them in places where these micro hemorrhages are. And I had sent these images to a couple of experts that uh, clinical doctors that use nail fold caproloscopy and they said oh we see those on occasion sometimes um, but they felt that it was most likely hemosiderin which is uh, deposits of iron so um, you know when you have hemorrhaging right there's iron in the blood and that iron will build up and form what's called hemosiderin right um, deposits but uh, I'm not so sure that's what it is um, because the photos of hemosiderin that I have seen don't quite look like that. Um, but what is interesting is that I was able to measure the size of these black dots and they are very similar in size to the microclots that was seen in my blood from the microclot testing that I had. Um, I would say they are slightly larger but approximately the same size it could be the reason they're slightly larger is because the microclot has already formed in the blood but by the you know I'm looking at um, you know hemorrhaging in the nail bed so by the time I observe these microclots in the hemorrhage in the nail bed they've clotted further and thus grown slightly larger um, so you know, I, I, I think it's really interesting and it's it's a topic worth pursuing more, but um, there's a lot there. And I think that hopefully the evidence that I've put forward, uh, you know, although not conclusive, is intriguing and suggestive enough to warrant further studies on this topic. So I hope you're ready for what is I think the biggest section of my entire video, uh, something really cool and exciting. I've conducted novel research uh, using TEM imaging of a punch biopsy. So what is TEM imaging? TEM stands for transmission electron microscopy. And it's a technique where you take a three millimeter punch biopsy, so it's a small piece of skin, and it's put in a fixative to 
hold everything in place, all the cells and everything, and keeps everything exactly in place. And then it's stained and put under an electron microscope. And so this microscope can see things that are very, very small, subcellular, um, you know, some of the best electron microscopes can get down, you can see one atom in size, right? So they can see very, very, very small things. And generally speaking, I find imaging really useful um, because I've been a part of a lot of studies that I have looked at a ton of genetics, a ton of blood-based biomarkers. And you know what's unique about all of them is that they're all successful every single one finds abnormalities but nobody knows what does it mean what causes it what do we do with this how do we treat this um people really lack the interpretation because there's no context for it but in imaging there is a context all of the genetic factors all of the environmental factors age and sex and everything is factored into what you see that that image that you take is the state of the patient. And um, so I find imaging by, I've done MRIs, I've done the nail fold cap caproloscopy, the TEM imaging. Imaging is clinically useful. I think people need to do more of it because we, when you don't know what you're looking for, an image will tell you everything that's going on. And true, you have to decipher a lot of different parts of it, but what you are deciphering is what's clinically relevant. Um, so anyway, um, I did TEM imaging and uh, there is always a lot going on in these images. So it is it is hard to say for sure um, what the results are when you haven't conducted a clinical study where you have tons of healthy age and sex match healthy controls um you know other cfs patients and and so forth so um it is tough to do this by myself but i did the best i can and um i think this absolutely will spur more research and studies in this area so of all the different cell types that are present in this punch biopsy there are two cell types that stuck out to me while looking through all the images as abnormal. Um, the first cell type is a Schwann cell. So in with uh, myelinated nerves, right? So these myelin is a coating. It's a protecting layer around nerves that helps to protect the nerve, but also increase conductance to make the nerves function uh, strong and healthily. Um, and around that myelin exists a Schwann cell. So the Schwann cells engulf the myelin and they're responsible for repairing any damage done to the myelin. And what we're seeing in these TEM images is really interesting. In the cytoplasm, which is the inner part of the Schwann cell, we're seeing these giant masses. Uh, and this is present in several different Schwann cells. Um, these giant masses of these, I'll say, white clumps and black dots. And I've spoken to um, dozens of top nerve morphologists, not just in the United States, but around the world. And people who do TEM imaging of nerves and so forth and see this stuff every day. And I asked them what their thoughts on it was. And uh, there's pretty unanimous consensus that number one, these masses in the Schwann cells are abnormal. Um, they are, uh, I've heard that they can sometimes be associated with axonal neuropathies, but um, the black dots are most likely glycogen deposits. So glycogen is uh, responsible for energy storage. So um, that's indicating an energy storage problem with the cells that repair damage to the nerves. And also are these um, white clumps, which I wasn't able to get any sort of input on, but I think that they are nissel substances, which are um, basically 
uh, clumps that are signs of uh, dysfunction in the endoplasmic reticulum, which is uh, protein processing. Um, so we're seeing these giant masses. And in fact, they're so large that it's very obvious this mass is actually pressing on and compressing one of the nerves. And, um, you know, that is something that's commonly seen to have kind of these distorted nerves that, you know, do have areas where there is compression. Um, you know, healthy people will show that to some degree and it, you know, it depends person to person. But um, that's not something that's just randomly occurring. It's very obvious that the pocket of this mass is what's pressing on the nerves. Uh, number two, and this is probably the most concerning thing that I've seen from the TEM imaging, are these pockets that form in the myelin. And I've seen many, many, many of these pockets in the myelin that uh, this is not like an MS where you get demyelination where all the myelin looks really wavy and it is breaking down. Uh, this is also not something that, there's something that looks similar, but it's not quite right. There's something called dense degeneration where you can, uh, if, if the cytoplasm of the surrounding Schwann cell is very, very dense, some of the material in that cytoplasm can get stuck in between layers of the uh, myelin as new myelin is forming. And I don't think that's what's going on because um, the masses it, uh, that's are in these pockets are not just between one layer and, a, and another. We see like multiple layers folded over. And so if you were to think about how do you get cytoplasmic material in between layers of, of several layers of myelin, um, the only two things that I could think of that would cause that are both mechanical forces. So either a puncture or, or a tear where this, this myelin is being mechanically damaged. And I think that validates and, and connects back and relates to all the supportive evidence I've given throughout this video discussing that titanium dioxide is a mechanically damaging substance. So if this myelin is being damaged by these nanoparticles, but then the Schwann cells aren't functioning properly, so they're unable to repair the damage with the myelin. Uh, and then you get these pockets that will most certainly uh, affect nerve conductivity and cause neurological symptoms. However, uh, there is not seen the presence of neuropathy in these samples. So neuropathy being nerve death. There isn't neuropathy because the nerve count is normal. So even though the count is normal, the nerves themselves are damaged and unhealthy. And that's pretty unanimously agreed upon between all the top nerve morphologists that uh, I've spoken with. So um, I think we need to change our approach to neuropathy testing when it comes to uh, patients with chronic illnesses that um, uh, just because nerves exist doesn't mean they're, they're healthy, doesn't mean you don't have neurological symptoms. And I think tests like TEM have to be done to look for the presence of damaged nerves. That nerve count is not sufficient, is not a sufficient test for assessing for neuropathy. Um, and then the second cell type that I seen that was affected are keratinocytes. These keratinocytes displayed the same abnormally large mass of glycogen deposits that the Schwann cells did. And this is uh, something that is also abnormal. They, it should not have this many glycogen deposits. It's, it's something that's weird. But uh, keratinocytes are responsible for forming a barrier in the skin. And so I think this is evidence that uh, of all the cell types that are in the sample, right, one of the two that's affected are responsible for forming an epithelial barrier. 
And uh, if the cells that form that epithelial barrier are not healthy, are not functioning properly due to VOC exposure or whatever else, um, then that will lead to barrier damage, which will lead to nanoparticle uptake, which will lead to uh, damage to myelinated nerves, which will lead to neurological symptoms. So we have a whole mechanism laid out here starting with the skin cells, the epithelial cells, which are the keratinocytes that form that barrier, not functioning properly, and ending with neurological damage. Um, so that's why these are the two important parts, the barrier damage and then particle intake are the two important parts of the induction of this disease. and we're potentially seeing evidence of both of those things happening in this imaging sample. So this is very interesting and very relevant. And I certainly feel that this warrants the need for further testing in this area. Um, and then one more thing on this topic while we're talking about TEM imaging is um, it's possible I might have seen direct evidence of nanoparticles in the sample. Um, it's hard to tell. It's, to be honest, I can't be sure at all. It, it's very hard to tell, but I see these black dots, these um, varying shapes, these black dots in the TEM sample that could be titanium dioxide or other nanoparticles. Like I said, there's there's different kinds, there's different shapes, there's different compositions. Even if it was uh, titanium dioxide, different titanium dioxide nanoparticles look very different from each other, um, depending on how they're ma manufactured and so forth. So just by looking at the black dots, I feel that it's not really possible to tell what they are. Um, so further testing needs to be done to determine what they are, but um, what you're seeing here could be an image of nanoparticles in the biopsy sample directly. Uh, so I think that's very interesting. And um, I hope other researchers will take a look at this and take it very seriously. Thank you for those who have clicked on this link and been watching this video. I'm now going to be closing out the video and um, I appreciate you all taking the time to educate yourselves and listen to uh, the many years of rigorous research that I've put in in this area and everything I have to say. And I hope that you will consider uh, the mechanisms that I've outlined today for yourself and for your own health and that you will inform others of my research and um, hopefully uh, other researchers out there do more studies and, and trials um, and take these mechanisms seriously, but also that you can change your lifestyle um, to avoid the things that I feel that have caused me harm and um, hopefully that leads to a benefit to you because that's the purpose of this to um, get an improvement in quality of life immediately for people who are suffering. Um, I also just want to share while I have a video that uh, about two years ago I did a simple weighted survey. I put out a survey to a couple hundred different patients with chronic fatigue syndrome um, and I asked them what, ben what treatments have you found beneficial and the ones that were more beneficial I asked people did this help or hurt you if it helped or hurt how much did it help or hurt so that's what a weighted survey is and um, I've found a lot of treatments that are beneficial and some that many doctors think that are beneficial that uh, the community has spoken and said has not helped them or has hurt them uh, but at the top of the list lorazotide acetate fecal transplants ARA 290 BPC 157 IV saline Oxymetrine, HBOT, and IVIG um, are towards the top of the list. So um, there are potential treatment options that, um, you know, even if none of these help all CFS patients, that are helpful enough that those should be the ones that we focus on. Um, 
most of the standard pills that we've heard of, like um, uh, Abilify, Fludrocortisone, uh, Mestinon, Amitriptyline, that are commonly prescribed are actually hurting patients. That's what the patient population is saying, that these are not helpful. Um, it, to be honest, it does make me sad that I was the one that had to do the survey. The survey is very, very easy to do. It did not take me very much time, um, but it can result in a massive benefit to people because people are desperate. They'll try anything to help themselves, but in that desperation, more often than not, they're taking things that are making them very, very sick and making them worse. And every single patient has to go through this. And it's totally unnecessary. If anyone is new to CFS or long COVID or whatever, they should start, if they wanna try different treatments, they should start with the treatments that are helping people, that people are saying, this has made a difference in my quality of life. That's where we need to start. Um, other researchers should be doing this. There's been too much of a waste on demographics. Oh, male versus female, what age? Um, what symptoms do they have? Um, those aren't important. People are sick and dying and desperate and we've got to get an immediate benefit to quality of life to them right now. And a simple survey like this can do that. Um, so feel free to study the survey. Again, the link to all my figures is in the description um but generally speaking i think that all these clinical trials are too slow and they're ineffective they're taking decades just to run uh, a clinical trial on one drug we're not going to get to answers quick enough because we need to go through a lot of different things um and we don't need 10 years to find out if a drug is helpful or not patients can tell you right away um, it's it, we need to get there faster so we don't need advanced science and decades of research to find some immediate improvements in quality of life um, I also think there is a tie-in uh, I've talked about several different chronic illnesses throughout this video but um, you know amongst the multiple chemical sensitivity and chronic fatigue syndrome patients uh, I also put out a survey to them and asked okay if you have MCS what percent of you also have chronic fatigue syndrome and vice versa and I asked two separate groups and both groups had about 80% of people say that they had the other so 80% of people with multiple chemical sensitivity say they have CFS and 80% of people with CFS say they have multiple chemical sensitivity so um, there is a very, very high degree of tie-in. I think that n number could be even larger because like I said, for me, I had CFS for four years before I found out that I had multiple chemical sensitivity. It can be very hard to identify what's making you sick when there's so many things in your environment that affect you. Um, but I, I do think there is a tug of war going on in this disease between healing and damage which is why pacing, limiting exertion, and avoiding exposures are so critical. I think that all the mechanisms that I've discussed throughout this video are likely happening to the general population. It's likely happening to everybody, but it's affecting healthy people um, either at a lesser extent or it's manifesting in different ways, as I've discussed, leading to cancer or autoimmune diseases um, or even mild things like uh, chronic migraines or allergies. Um, so I think this type of studying doesn't just apply to MCS or CFS patients. This type of studies uh, apply to everybody and they're critical that we get these done. It's critical that we have environmental science be a part of medicine. Um, I think it should be uh, more than 50% of medical research should be environmental science. Uh, we, that's where we're going to find answers. That's where we're going to find benefit and quality of life, not just in lifespan, but in health span. That's what people need. Um, and so many of these chemicals are just unregulated. Nobody's talking about them. Nobody's discussing them. And um, uh, it, it, it's really bad for the entire human race. It's bad for everybody. Um, but what 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 can be done about this like i said i don't have any protocol or cure but just thinking hypothetically right 
I think there's three things that can be done. Number one, repair the epithelial barrier. And I think a <clears throat> low VOC environment is absolutely critical for repairing this barrier. VOCs directly damage it, and so patients need to be in a low VOC environment. I think as a population, we need to phase out all these toxic products that are uh, contributing to this damage. There's no need for them to even exist, but um, uh, I, I think the place to start is building homes, zero VOC homes where, where people are safe and can go to heal um, and homes that are uh, not just shelter, but a medical device. Um, I also think it's possible that nebulization of placental stem cells, I say placental because if you were to take stem cells from your own body, you could also just be harvesting more nanoparticles and microclots that you're uh, then just bringing back, putting right back into the body. Um, but also if there's any genetic susceptibilities, placental stem cells get around that. And I say nebulization because you're, you're gonna breathe these stem cells in. And uh, if breathing in something is damaged the barrier in your lungs, then breathing in stem cells is gonna deliver them right to the site that's damaged to get that repair done. So I think that that is a potential treatment that could be beneficial for this. Number two is removal of the titanium dioxide nanoparticles. So I have tried many things. Um, for a while, the parent technique lymphatic massages helped me a lot. Uh, but in 2021, they stopped helping me. And I think it's because I reached this threshold point where I had too many of them that moving them around in my body was just damaging uh, tissue and nerves more. Um, that my body wasn't able to repair that fast enough. Uh, so I think when you hit that point, what becomes critical are blood draws. And I'm, you know, tons of people with MCS have had blood draws. I'm not saying if you get, just go get any blood test, get your blood drawn, it'll cure you. Obviously not. But I have found when I go through these periods of intense pain and pressure, particularly in my arms, um, which usually happens seasonally, right? So during October, there's an October slide where pain gets worse. When I hit these episodes of increased pain and I go get you know a few b vials of blood drawn, uh, that pain gets substantially better. It doesn't get rid of my other symptoms, but the pain and pressure goes way, 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 way down. So I do think blood draws by themselves can be a potentially therapeutic option because the body really doesn't have any good method for removal of these particles. Um, so, you know, getting a blood draw to remove them directly, um, even if that's just, you know, there, it could be that compartment syndrome, so uh, muscle compartment pressure is causing this pain and the blood draw um, helps relieve uh, venous outflow obstruction. So that's possible. and. Um, but either way, uh, I have found these blood draws to be helpful and, and I do uh, advise patients get them done, uh, like I said, during episodes of increased uh, pain and pressure because I think bioavailability is a problem. Where are the particles? What are, where are they stuck? Can they be made available? What part of the body are they in? Um, so I think bioavailability is an issue, so it's not going to help everyone and it's not going to help even if the people it does help it's not going to help them all the time it will only help during certain windows uh number three is improve regenerative capacity i think that's very difficult to do without doing the first two things uh i really don't have any good ideas for how to do this because anything that improves regenerative capacity will increase function increase exertion increase blood flow which will make everything worse for people that have these nanoparticles in their system so i think uh the best thing to do is start with barrier repair um remove nanoparticles uh do lymphatic massages um you know as connective tissue and, and nerves begin to regenerate and then uh when you these when, you, when you're in a safe environment for a long enough period of time, eventually things that improve regenerative capacity, such as um, 
you know, different peptide therapies or red light therapy or whatever could be beneficial, but when you're going through a low point, they will not be. Um, so that's everything that I have today. Thank you again for listening and watching my video. And um, I appreciate you taking the time and I hope we can get the word about these, uh, about barrier damage and these nanoparticles out there so that people can be made aware of what could be making them very, very ill. Thank you.